we have a few minutes thinking about how this might affect us, this crossing of the Red Sea. And I wanted to show it this morning, but I didn't because it's a bit of a 12 plus film. But get home this afternoon, go onto YouTube and check out um, on YouTube the Exodus God and, F- God and Kings film. And they show the crossing of the Red Sea. I showed it this morning at the 8.30. Um, and it's not strictly biblical. Okay, so, so Hollywood does have, get the Bible and have a bit of a play with it. Um, but it shows us the intensity of what this might have looked like. Because I don't know about you, but this is one of those maybe kind of stories that sounds quite fairy tale like doesn't it? It sounds quite nice. Skipping along the beach, uh, made with a bit of the nice rivers, the fish saying hello as we walk past. But this was a significant time in the story of, of God's people. A significant story of God's rescue. So the fleeing Israelites are running away. Pharaoh at last has let them go. Many of us have been following the story through Exodus. Maybe you've been doing your daily Bible readings. The Israelites get to the edge of the Red Sea and they're like, oh great. You know, this isn't a small stream or river to jump over. This is an an ocean. This is a sea to get to. And listen to what they say. The Israelites said to Moses, are we going to die here as well? Have you brought us out into the desert to die? We could have stayed in Egypt and died, they said. Moses' staff comes into play again, doesn't he? The the Israelites say, we're going to die, we're scared. And once again, Moses' staff comes into play. You might remember it was back in Pharaoh's palace where Moses got his stick, threw it in front of Pharaoh and it changed into a snake as a sign of God's power. And it happens again. We think there might be two million people of the Israelite family fleeing Egypt. Two million people running across the ocean. With all their animals, it would have taken hours. The Egyptian army realised what's happening. They think, what have we done? We've lost our free slave force. We've lost the people that make us our money. How on earth are we going to cope? And they chase after the Egyptians. They get to the Red Sea It opens eventually, the people of Israel run through, and the Egyptian army decide to follow. You know, a sign of maybe madness, desperation on Pharaoh's part, as he thinks, I need these people back. Even Pharaoh's own army said to him, don't do it. In verse 23 of chapter 14, the Egyptians say, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord's on their side. The Lord's fighting for them. But Pharaoh says, no, I'm going to get them. We need them back. He's lost his production line. Just before dawn, after the Israelites are safely on that side, we know what happens. The Egyptian army are washed away. And God's people are safe. They're free. They're no longer slaves to Pharaoh. But as so often with the Bible, this isn't the end of the story. It might be the end of the physical crossing of the Red Sea, but there's so much of this historical event that comes up again and again. Paul writes of it hundreds of years later in his letter to the church in Corinth. He says, I want you to know, sisters and brothers, our fathers were under the cloud. They passed through the sea. They were baptised into Moses. In other words, when we look at this story through the lens of Jesus, we call that Christological viewpoint. When we look at it through the viewpoint of Jesus, it gives such a, a deep meaning. In fact, really interestingly, back in Exodus 14, we read of the angel of the Lord standing between, he's normally at the front leading the Israelites, he goes to the back of the Israelites and he protects them from the Egyptian army, the angel of the Lord. And and whenever this phrase angel of of the Lord pops up in the Old Testament, it's it's a pretty good bet, I think, and tradition teaches us too, that, that it might well be teaching of Jesus. So you've got Jesus, the incarnate God, stood there. God himself stood between his people and the people of the Egyptians. And I love that because it reminds me that that so often when I feel like the army's coming or that I'm being faced with despair or hopelessness or fear or I'm under attack, Jesus has stood between me and the enemy. And how often do I not know that? How often am I unaware of the fact that the Lord himself is on my side, he's fighting for me, he's keeping the army at bay. So Paul writes to the Corinthians saying, it's talking about this, talking about the crossing of the Red Sea and how important it is, and he links it to faith. 
It's linked to faith in Hebrews 11 when we read that by faith they passed through the Red Sea. I don't know about you, but if I was stood on the edge of the ocean and it parted and God said, go on then, mate, or go on then, David, I I wouldn't be the first one, I don't think, to jump onto the dry land. I think I'd be in the middle. I might even be at the back because then if it all goes wrong, you've got a better chance of running back to safety. I don't know. But but they had faith. Faith, maybe a little bit of faith that God was going to do what he said he would do. So as we come into land, I wonder what chains we might feel that we still have, like the people of Israel had. They were led out of slavery. Their chains were broken. The, the coming through the Red Sea, coming out of slavery into the promised land. What do we feel enslaved by? What do we feel chained by? Because this story isn't the end, is it? When they come out of the Red Sea, Miriam, the great prophetess, starts singing. She says, I'll sing to the Lord. He's exalted. The Lord is my strength and my deliverer. We respond to what God has done with amazing praise. And part of that praise is baptism, isn't it? Part of that praise is saying to the Lord, um, okay, I, I want to come through baptism for you. Paul says, I want you to know that they passed through the sea, they were baptised into Moses. Many of us um, who were baptised will think back to our day of baptism. Maybe we were very little, maybe we were older, and we will remember passing through the water, dying to self and doing our best to live for Jesus, leaving the chains behind and going to the promised land, saying goodbye to the enemy and doing our best to live for Jesus. And it reminds us too, as we come out of the water, that the grave is not the end. I've mentioned a couple of weeks ago that we're going to be doing some baptisms on Easter Sunday, but I wanted to flag it up now because this is the perfect time to to remind us that maybe um, you haven't yet had that public declaration of faith for yourself. On Easter Sunday, we're going to have a baptistry here. We're going to have it full to the brim of water. There's at least two people that are going to be going down and coming up again um, as a sign of new life, that coming through the Red Sea from a place of kind of slavery, a symbol of new life. Maybe as we've been going through the story of Exodus, you're thinking, yeah, that's me actually. I want to do a public declaration. Maybe you've been a Christian for years and you haven't yet done it. And this is the time of a public declaration of your faith. I've had a couple of people ask me if I was baptised as a baby, can we be re-baptised? And the the complicated answer is you can reaffirm the vows made on your behalf. You can reaffirm them for yourself through baptism. So if that's something you'd like to do, grab me afterwards or on the 13th of March, not February. I didn't put the the month in the notice sheet because I forgot today's a leap year. (laughs) So if you turn up next Sunday, I'll probably be here anyway. But uh, next month on the 13th, there'll just be a little chat afterwards if you're interested in knowing more about baptism. I had to mention that because the coming through the Red Sea reminds us of the significance of, of going through the water of baptism. But let's go back to those chains to end with. You've all got a bit of paper, hopefully, on the way in. um, And and that bit of paper that looks like a kind of those things that you put up at Christmas. If you haven't got one, if you wave your hand, Glenys will bring you one. Look at that. Well done, whoever was on the door. No one got through without one. And what I'd like us to do in the next few moments, wow, it is exciting, isn't it? It is exciting. I'd like you to think of something that might be chaining you back. It might be something from the past that's worrying you. It might be something about the future that you're fearful of. It might be just a prayer request you have. It might be something that you're doubting. We've all been there. That's okay. There's no condemnation. And what I'd invite you to do is just write that on your bit of paper. And then we're going to, that bit, that thing peels off or licks and turns into a chain. And then during the next song, we're going to break them as a symbol of God breaking our chains. So just in the next moment of of stillness, if the children are making a noise, that's okay. But write on your bit of paper something that is chaining you back, holding you back from the next step that you want, crossing the Red Sea. What chains might we want the Lord to break? And if you can't think of anything, that's okay. Maybe you just have a prayer request. Maybe you want the Lord to do something for you. Jesus often says in the Gospels, what can I do for you? So maybe this morning, if that's not resonating with you, what can Jesus do for you?
before we say a prayer about that, um, during the next song, which is No Longer Slaves, there's a chorus that says, you split the sea so I could walk right through it, I think. Yes. Um, and if you'd like to, what we can do then is kind of lift the chains over our head, if you'd like, and break them. Um, just as a symbol, a reminder um, that God breaks chains and has led us from slavery into freedom. If you'd rather keep it as a personal thing, that's fine. If it's just between you and the Lord, you might want to break it in your pocket, that's great, that's fine. Um, but sometimes it's nice to be public with our declaration of all that God has done. And finally, I can't go without saying that if you don't yet know Jesus today, uh, and as we've been going through this morning, you've been thinking, oh my goodness, yeah, th this sounds really great. I'd love to get to know better the God who, who rescues us. Grab me afterwards. The prayer team are going to be at the front during the next couple of songs. They're going to be stood there. They would love to pray with you if that's you. If, if as we were talking about chains breaking, you, you really felt your spirit stir, again, they'd love to pray with you. You can just say, please pray for me. You don't have to tell them everything if you don't like to. That's absolutely fine. But let's say a prayer and then we're going to stand together. Father God, we thank you that you have brought us out of slavery into the promised land. Thank you for your faithfulness to the, the people of Israel, that you did what you said you would do. And so we bring before you these things that chain us, these things that hold us back from being all that we are called to be. And we leave them before you. We pray that we might have a, a, spe a special, fresh understanding this morning of who we are in you, our identity as a child of the King. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand together to sing if you'd like to. There are still some, I think if you'd like to paint, it's still, oh, it's, the paint is finished, brilliant. There are some instruments and flags if you'd like to. If you're still having time with the Lord, that's okay. Don't feel like you have to stand and, and join in. Um, but when we come to that chorus, if you'd like to break those chains, you're invited to do so. So let's stand and sing together.